We thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for His infinite love, mercy, and kindness, allowing us to be in His holy presence, in His holy church, sharing His word, which is the truth, and there is no other truth but the word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For those who are with us in this holy church and those who are watching us for live streaming, I pray that you're always, always in good health and in good spirit in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 119, verses 49 to 64. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I remembered your judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. This has become mine because I kept your precepts. You are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your words. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have bound me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgments. I am a companion of all who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your mercy. Teach me your statutes. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Um, it's been brought to our attention recently there has been um, a video circulating in TikTok and I don't know where else saying that the bishop has two weeks to live. Yeah. Um, and, and somebody is saying, uh, farewell, bishop, and we're really sad to see you go. Look, I was, I was extremely excited when I heard that I have two weeks to live because I don't want to stay in this world. Um, for me, it's, it's over. Uh, whether I stay or not, it doesn't matter really. Uh, I've had my share of this world, and I, I pray that the Lord takes me today before tomorrow. I want to be with Him. This is not running away. This is not an escape, no. I'm saying it with confidence in the Lord Jesus. I love you, Lord, and I choose you any time of the day, all day long, to be with you. I don't care about the world and whatever the world gives. So I, I was extremely happy. I thanked the person who did this video. Thank you so much. I didn't know that I was dying in two weeks. So, um, but I'm not sure if I will go in two weeks time. Maybe, I don't know. But as far as being sick and he has got two weeks left, uh, that's news to me. So whether it's a disappointment to some who are listening or it's a, it's a happy occasion, I'm just letting you know, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think I am sick and I'm dying in two weeks' time, but everything is in the Lord's capable hands. But there is no such thing. I am not sick. I'm not dying. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry to say this. <laughs> Maybe some of them heard it and said, yes, finally we're getting rid of this old bishop. But sorry, guys. I'm still sitting on your heart. <laughs> And if you need uh, my funeral services, I'll come and do it for you. <laughs> um, okay, so now we come to our topic, the book of Revelation. And it's a continuation uh, with, chapter one, with verse 1, chapter 19. So we'll go to Revelation 19 
and verse 1. We'll read it. Last week, we commented on the first half of the verse. And God willing, today, we'll comment on the second half of the verse. So it's Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God, and all glory be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Well, just a recap of what we said last week. Um, John the Beloved says after this, what was after this? After all of chapter 18. Chapter 18 was all about punishment, the wrath of God coming upon this woman, the UN slash US. So it was all miserable. Chapter 18 is all about negative, negative, negative. This woman is the harlot, the mother of harlots. This woman, he, uh, the angel took me to the desert to show me the woman. She's going to be, you know, striked by the, uh, by the wrath of God. The Lord Jesus is coming to punish this woman. So it's all negative. And after all that negativity, the Lord comes back and gives us an absolute total contrast to chapter 18, and that is chapter 19. Chapter 19 talks about another woman, but this woman is the bride of Christ. This woman, to, to be seen by John the Beloved, the angel took him to heaven, not to the desert. He took him up, not down. This woman is holy, the other one unholy. This woman is elevated. The other one is swimming in the filth of the world. So now chapter 19, a total changeover. It's positive, it's bright, it is absolutely happy and joyous news. And this is the way God works in every one of us life. We go through rough seas, but remember, they don't last. After that, you'll have some comfortable times. We go through some dark tunnels, but at the end, there is the light. We go through some really difficult times, but there is also comfort coming. This is God. He will never leave you in, in absolute chaos and heavy burden, always impossible. There is always a relief after that suffering. Remember this, trust in this, believe in this, and if you believe, you shall receive. So now, chapter 19 talks about the bride of Christ, this woman. And he took John the Beloved, this angel, took him to heaven to show him this woman. John the Beloved heard a voice from a great multitude. And we spoke about this, a great multitude, but John, he heard a voice, one coming from multitude of people. And we said, because that's the language of heaven. Heaven speaks one language, one tongue, one heart, because heaven and the people of heaven are all living for Christ. None of them live for themselves. And we gave an example. If a thousand people came into the church and each one came as their own self, we have 1,000 different individuals walking in. 1,000 voices, 1,000 thoughts, 1,000 ways. No one is identical to the next. The Lord says, when you come to me, you need to come as one, not many. Yes, you are many, but this many needs to come as one, i.e., you need to come and say, I was crucified with Christ so that I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. So when the thousand people come into the church and every single one denying themselves in order to live for Christ, when the thousand speak, only one voice will be heard, and that is Christ. Because everyone in that thousand says, I'm living not for myself, I came to live for the Lord. Imagine if we did this on earth, heaven is on earth. We won't have any problems, true or not. We won't have any divisions, we won't have any arguments. And this applies everywhere, at home, at work, in the church, outside the church. When everybody lives for the Lord Jesus, why would we fight? Why do we fight and argue? Because I want to live for myself. The other person wants to live for themselves. And since we are never the same, we will never meet and unite. And this is why 
the main reason why the church was divided because everybody said my throne is greater than the other forget about your throne my dear friend forget about my throne how about the throne of Christ how about we unite in the Lord for a change well so John the beloved heard a voice coming from a great multitude in heaven so no matter how many people are in heaven since they all live for Christ then when they speak is only one voice is heard and that is the voice of Christ only one way only one thought it's all Christ that's why heaven is where unity peace tranquility harmony always exists because Christ is the king of peace you'll never argue when you live for him you'll never fight you will never divide after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying alleluia now we stopped at this last week alleluia and we said it is the first time ever this word alleluia being mentioned in the entire New Testament let alone the entire Holy Bible when you read from Genesis to Revelation you will never see the word alleluia mentioned in the entire Holy Bible both Old and New Testament except in Revelation chapter 19 verse 1 that's the first time ever and the last time ever the word alleluia and we said about hallelujah means praising uh, praising Yahweh rejoicing in the Lord and Yahweh means the I am and we said why John the beloved wrote alleluia instead of praising Yahweh because if he had written and the great multitude um, praised Yahweh then it would have been they praised him because he has done something for them that's why they praised him you will praise you will only praise someone when they've done a favor to you so that's why John the beloved he left the word alleluia instead of literally transliterated into praising Yahweh he said no alleluia why because to say to all of us we rejoice in the Lord we praise the Lord we thank the Lord for himself not for what he has done for me you need you need to love the Lord for being him I love you for who you are not what you've done I don't love you because you healed me I don't love you because you comforted me I don't love you because you saved me I don't love you because you got me out of the grave and out of death I love you because you are Jesus Christ of Nazareth I love you for you not for what you do and this is the true genuine love and we gave a brilliant example between a husband and a wife the husband goes on a business trip overseas and then he calls his wife after two weeks being away honey what would you like me to bring you from Alberta Canada and honey is in Sydney Australia the wife replies and says to him "Hun, I don't want nothing from you I just want you you are my gift if if the couple live this way you'll never come to church and say to the priest I want a divorce now in chapter 19 the word hallelujah mentioned for the first time and it's mentioned four times in chapter 19 it's mentioned four times in chapter 19 now why four times let us contemplate on this for a moment why four times you see the word of God is joy for me and you and for all of us and the word of God the Lord gave it in the New Testament in the four Gospels why four times alleluia rejoice in Yahweh praise Yahweh why four times because God gave his word through four gospel writers Matthew Mark Luke and John so Matthew Mark Luke and John it is the word of God and the word of God is joy happiness thankfulness and praising Yahweh thank you for giving me you thank you for giving me you through the four gospel writers and why four gospel writers because there are four corners to this world east west north and south meaning my word God is saying my word is for the four corners of the world and I gave it through four gospel writers and in Revelation 19 Alleluia is given four times so my word is for every human being without differentiation because God is love and God created every single human being on the basis of love God loves everyone 
He never differentiate between this nation or that nation, between this race or that race, between this color or that color. Every human being to God is his child. And that's why Hallelujah is mentioned four times in Revelation 19. And the heart of the Holy Bible, the center of the Holy Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved the entire world. That's why he gave his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for the Muslim, for the Buddhist, for the Hindus, for the atheist, for everyone, for everyone, my beloved. What is this joy of this great multitude in heaven? Why are they saying, Alleluia? Why are, why are they praising God, Yahweh? Why are they joyous in Yahweh, in God? Why? It continues because salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Four things. The reason why they are saying Alleluia, why they are joyous in the Lord, why they are praising the Lord, for four things they are rejoicing in the Lord. Because of salvation, second, glory, third, honor, fourth, power belongs to our Lord, to the Lord our God. The great multitude is saying Alleluia, or praising, rejoicing in Yahweh, because of these four things, salvation, glory, honor, and power. And power belongs to the Lord, our God, our God. Who is the Lord, our God? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Goes with that saying, all glory to his holy and mighty name. So salvation, glory, honor, and power belongs to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the entire multitude in heaven, all with one voice, shouting, Alleluia. To Jesus Christ of Nazareth, to you belongs salvation. To you belongs glory. To you belongs honor. And to you belongs power. So what is heaven preoccupied with? One thing and one person, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Why? Because he is heaven to those who seek heaven. He is heaven itself. We've mentioned this so many times and we'll mention it again. Don't ever get too entangled with heaven and hell or if there is anything between heaven and hell. Don't get yourself too busy with this. Focus on Jesus Christ of Nazareth, period. Why do I care about heaven? Why do I care about hell or anything else? All I care about, I wish to be, and I want, and I choose to be with the Lord Jesus. When I'm with the Lord, I'm in heaven. He is heaven. I rejoice because who you are for your own self. You are my joy. I don't care if you heal me. I don't care if you save me. I don't care if you bring me out of hell. I don't care for what you've done. You've done it on the cross. You've done it. But all of that aside, I adore you. I worship you. I thank you because you are Jesus. Stunning. True love. So misunderstood in the end times. So misunderstood. True love. You need to fall in love with Christ to understand where the bishop is coming from. You need to fall in love. It's not about I went to church and I've done my duty. No, Christ is life. You breathe him, you absorb him, you melt and dissolve yourself entirely in him. You, you become him, he becomes you. Not two anymore, one, one. It's when I speak, he speaks. When he speaks, I also speak through him. We become one, one. So the Lord our God is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one and only. All glory to his holy and mighty name. Christ, now it began, this great multitude, they began saying Alleluia because of number one, salvation. Look how the Holy Spirit is inspiring John the Beloved to write. Why in this particular order? We'll find out very shortly. It'll take about 10 hours. You're not in a rush. Come on. 
Christ in his first coming, he gave us salvation. The only thing Christ's first coming was to give us salvation. But the world was in the bosom of Satan. The Lord in his first coming came to give us salvation, but the world was placed in the bosom of Satan, swimming in sin. How did the Lord Jesus give salvation in his first coming? By establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. And the kingdom of heaven was established on earth the moment the Lord Jesus was nailed on the cross. The crucifixion of Christ was the establishment of the kingdom of heaven on earth. When that kingdom was established on earth, salvation came. Christ's first coming is the establishment of the kingdom of Christ and his patience. Now, please pay attention. The first coming of the Lord was to establish the, his kingdom on earth. And with his kingdom had to come patience. So, in other words, when we read in Revelation chapter 1 verse 9, which we read at the very beginning of it. In Revelation 1 9, look at John the Beloved, how he puts it so beautifully. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So the kingdom of Christ, patience is associated with, with it. So the first coming of the Lord, he gave us salvation, but with salvation, he demanded of us patience. He demanded of us patience. So Christ's first coming is salvation and patience. Christ's second coming will give us salvation and glory. That's why they all shouted, Hallelujah, salvation followed by glory. So salvation, first coming, glory, second coming. See how the Holy Bible talks. So what is the word of our Lord Jesus Christ trying to tell us? He's trying to tell us the following. Every Christian who is walking in the Lord's path, every Christian who is walking in the Lord's path received salvation. However, that Christian needs to be patient with the salvation. Every Christian who received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior was given in the first coming of the Lord. The Lord gave that Christian salvation. But with that salvation, he said to that Christian, you need to be patient with this salvation. Because whoever walks in the Lord's path will be persecuted. This goes without fail. Whoever walks in the Lord's path will be persecuted and there is no escape from it. When you try your hardest by the grace of the Lord, you truly and genuinely wish to be with the Lord. You want to make him your portion. As long as you are following in the footprints of the Lord Jesus as up, up until the second coming. So when it's his first coming and you're walking in the Lord's footpath, you will 100% be persecuted. And let me assure you and guarantee this will, will, will happen. You will be persecuted by two categories. One, your own Christians. Secondly, the world. So not only the strangers, but those who are family members. So if you are a true follower of the Lord at home, your own family members will persecute you. And if you are a true follower of the Lord in the church, your own church family will persecute you. They'll go against you. Why? Because the Lord says, my first coming, I gave you my salvation, but with it, it required from you patience. Salvation from me, patience from you because my first coming I did not rule completely on the whole world who did I rule over those who received me as Lord and Savior from the world I took them out of the world and I brought them into the kingdom of heaven so those whom I took out of the world and brought them into the kingdom of heaven 
to those I gave salvation, but I said to them, you are still in the world. And as long as you're in the world, you will be persecuted because the way the world treated me, I, Jesus Christ, will treat you the same. There is no disciple greater than his or her master. No one. No one is greater than the Lord. So whatever the Lord endured, if you're walking in his footprints, you will have to endure according to what you are capable of handling by his grace. And this is why you need patience. You go and speak about the Lord Jesus, people will go against you. Within the church and outside the church, they will ridicule you. They will say some nasty things about you. They will depose you. They will kick you, punch you left, right and center. Your own people. Why? Because you wish to be for the Lord. Because not every Christian is for the Lord. So when you are speaking the language of the Lord in his own house and those people who are in his house that have chosen to live for themselves, not for the Lord, they will not speak with one voice. They will not speak the same language because if I am in the house of the Lord and doing it my way, then I am different to Jesus Christ. And I am different to every other Christian who wishes to live for Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So when I speak the Lord's language, those who chose not to live for the Lord, but for themselves, they will go against me and persecute me because their language is not the Lord's. The Lord is love. They lack love. The Lord is humility. They lack humility. The Lord is forgiving. They lack forgiveness. That's why they will retaliate. You are affecting us. You are giving us grief and discomfort. You choose to live at the gutter, but we choose to live in high places. How is that going to work? It's not going to work now because it's causing them a lot of problems and issues. So now they have either to try and imitate the Lord, but it's very costly because they don't want to give up on this luxurious lifestyle. So how can I give up on the limousine? How can I give up on the red carpet rolled under my feet? How can I give up on this comfort sitting behind the desk, not even making my fingernail go a little bit muddy? How can I give up on this gold and linen? How can I give up on the mansion? How can I give up on the millions? Because if I truly follow the Lord, the Lord said, the son of man has no place to even put and lay his head on. The birds of the sky have a nest and the foxes have homes, but the son of man has no place to put his head on. Do you want me to give up on all this lifestyle and luxury and prestigious way of living? for the sake of Jesus and on top of that I follow him and then be persecuted hated despised kicked punched ridiculed by the world no way let me sit with the prime minister and the president and those big caliber boys rich people I need to sit with them I need to dine with them I need to live a life of glory I can't give all that up for the sake of Jesus and then be persecuted for his sake on top of that. I wish if he had made me live like a king, I would have followed him, but I'm not even a slave and a street beggar when I follow Jesus. I'm not giving up on all that. So what's going to happen? Persecute everyone who wishes to live for Jesus Christ, even within his own house. Now, if the Christians who are supposed to be brothers in Christ are persecuting their own brother. What do you think the world is going to do to a Christian, a true Christian following Jesus? <laughs> a prophet is without honor in his own town, in his own city. But the question is, who are we living for? Are we living for ourselves? Are we living for people around us? Let me tell you, my dear friend, it matters not to me whether you love me or despise me. It matters not to me whether you accept me or reject me. 
it matters not to me whether you agree or disagree with me because I was not brought into existence to make you satisfied to please you I was brought into existence not by you not by me or anyone I was brought into existence by the love of my life his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth I came to please him and if pleasing the Lord meaning means that you go against me then so be it but I will pray for you always 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 don't ever think that I will change my way of thinking my way of life because you are persecuting your own brother because my sweetheart Jesus taught me love those who persecute you love them it is not me who is good it's the Lord God is good his name is Jesus Christ he's my master he's my teacher I listen to him not to anyone else so you do whatever you wish that ain't gonna change me brother I love you bro relax mate why are you so nervous why are you so upset life is not worth it brother it's not worth it trust me trust the Lord <laughs> it's not worth it love everyone it's not my doings it's the Lord's I can't do anything without him read John 15 5 the Lord says without me you cannot do anything without me you cannot do anything you cannot so when I'm able to love someone who is persecuting me, it's the Lord. I was speaking to a beloved soul of the Lord today. And in the conversation, we, we mentioned what John the Beloved himself said about Jesus Christ of Nazareth when he met them at the Sea of Galilee after resurrection the third time, which is John chapter 21, the last chapter of the book of the Gospel of John, or according to John. The Lord revealed himself at the Sea of Galilee the third time after resurrection. They did not recognize him at the beginning. But then John the Beloved, when he heard the Lord Jesus saying or calling out to them and saying, Oh, little kids, do you have any fish? They replied and said, No, all night long we've been fishing and we caught absolutely nothing. Then the Lord said, Cast the net on the right hand of the boat and you will catch they caught the net was so filled it was about to be ripped apart and they caught big fish 150 and three and John the beloved says this stunning breathtaking statement it is the Lord let's contemplate on this for a moment please it is the Lord this applies to every aspect of life this applies from head to toe in every way form and shape it is the Lord today I woke up in the morning why did I why was I able to wake up in the morning because it is the Lord I was able to wash my face and change the clothes and ate something to get ready to go out of the house why was that made possible because it is the Lord I went out and I came back because it's the Lord I slept and I woke up because it's the Lord I came to church and I attended the Bible preach because it is the Lord I did everything it's the Lord it is not me it's the Lord it is the Lord amazing if every Christian just contemplated on these four words it is the Lord and applied this to their life daily life there is no problem I wanted to marry Rachel I ended up marrying Elizabeth it is the Lord <laughs> maybe Rachel wasn't gonna be good to you I don't know don't be upset I went into the exam and I failed it is the Lord because maybe the Lord is trying to teach me something through my failure why are you upset I tried this business and I failed it is the Lord I succeeded it's the Lord don't be happy about success and don't be upset about failure rejoice because it's the Lord and always it's the Lord now why is it salvation and patience because whoever walks in the Lord's path will be persecuted by Christians and the world therefore it, requ it requires patience imagine this the Lord Jesus comes to me and he says I came to choose you I have purchased you with my own precious blood I am giving you 
In my hands, I'm offering you salvation. Through those wounds, I'm offering you salvation. Will you accept? I said, yes, Lord, I accept. I agree. Thank you so much for this salvation. I received salvation. The Lord says, follow me. Then I started following the Lord. As I followed him one day, one month, one year, 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years, along the way, people started going against me. Imagine after following the Lord and accepting the Lord in my life as Lord and Savior, then I became a target where people started punching me, kicking me and ridiculing me. What am I going to do? Say to the Lord, time out, Lord, enough is enough. That's it. I've had enough. I'm walking away. Where is your patience? Are you going to deny the Lord just because someone went against you and gave you hell? Not a hard time. Hell. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's good to be in hell, by the way. Have you been to hell? Well, man, one of those days I'll take you with me. <laughs> you see, if you don't let the Lord take over, if you don't let the Lord be the true teacher, you'll never understand. You'll never understand. It takes hell to appreciate heaven. And it takes darkness to appreciate the light. And it, it, it takes brokenness, failure to the core to appreciate wholesomeness and success the lord will allow persecution come our way for our own benefit and growth and without persecution we will never ever be able to start understanding the concept of humility and without humility there is no god because humility gives you wisdom and wisdom only god gives not universities. When we read in the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 5, you know, the Mount of Beatitudes. What did the Lord Jesus say? He came to teach us, Blessed are the poor in, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Eight blessings or nine blessings. After the nine blessings, that is my lesson. I went to Jesus Christ's school of thought, and I studied theology at the hand of the teacher and the master of all. So Jesus Christ taught me all these blessings. And then at the end of my hard studies for years, I, the time came to graduate from the University of Theology of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When I graduated, I thought that's it, it's over now. I can enjoy the success. He says, no, after graduation, you will be kicked, punched, dragged in the street, ridiculed and cast out. Congratulations. Are you patient enough? No. The first coming, we need to be patient in order to be glorified in his second coming. An example, one person studies so hard for so many years to become a doctor. It required a lot of patience in order to be a doctor. But after all those many hard years of studying and sacrificing, that person became a doctor. But after all that hard work, the reward is awaiting. I became a doctor and I started helping people, healing people. When I am an honest doctor, I started helping people and healing people. So those hardships, I got the reward for them. I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord. So Christ first coming salvation. Those who accepted him received salvation, but they needed to be patient because persecution followed salvation. And then in Matthew 24, 13, the Lord is saying, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Not saved once, saved forever. No such thing. You need to endure till the end in order to be saved. In the second coming of Christ, when we see all those people in the Lord's glory, we will be shocked. Why? Because on earth, we looked at people and we thought of them not much. But in heaven, those who were on earth, nothing to us in heaven we saw them everything don't judge don't judge the book by its cover yes i may look kind of old from outside and worn out but from inside i'm renewed like an eagle on earth we pass so many people by and we don't even think anything of them in heaven we're gonna see them shining like a sun because those people whom you thought not much of they were hidden in Christ on earth. Christ revealed them at the end. They accepted so much for the Lord, for his sake. They accepted persecutions and they kept their silence. 
they kept their patience they trusted in the Lord and they hoped for in the Lord's salvation and they were awaiting the glorious moment on his second return Lord I was ridiculed on earth I became a nothing they stepped on me they treated me as if I am an absolute nothing but when you came you rewarded and you paid everyone accordingly they saw their place and you showed me my place when I am patient awaiting for your second coming and the first coming you gave me salvation and through salvation persecution you by your grace I was patient till the second coming happens and when I endured till the end when you came the second time you gave me after salvation glory glory my advice to all of us if someone says anything nasty against you don't retaliate don't lose it don't get angry and upset and jump at it no you know when someone does something trying to provoke you and you are as a cool as a cucumber <laughs> drives them it will drive them mad all right so look be cool calm and collected oh, they said this about you they said that about you relax so what people hate your guts <laughs> who cares it's not my problem it's their problem seriously man love the Lord be focused on the Lord be pre preoccupied with the Lord who cares what people say don't worry like I'll fix him up later <laughs> red belt in karate be patient when you are persecuted salvation was given to us at the ultimate cost the blood of the Lamb of God Jesus it took him to die on the cross to give us salvation this salvation is not cheap it's not given that easily it is not given that cheaply what comes easy goes easy but if you want to gain something priceless something precious you need to sweat it out for it you cannot expect to buy a mansion overlooking the darling harbor for a hundred thousand dollars it takes millions millions and the millions require a lot of hard work unless you steal a bank but that's not genuine it's not genuine you need to earn it genuinely you need to have it genuinely and that's why the Lord gave you the ultimate price his blood his life you need to treat that with utmost care and caution that's why you need to be patient God gave you a priceless gift his beloved son the ultimate gift he is worth it to be suffering for him he is worth it to be persecuted for his name's sake. He is worth it all day long. He is worth it even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. For my, the love of my life, Jesus Christ is with me. And I love the Lord. The Lord is worth it. You see, people on earth who are so big in the eyes of the Lord, yet they're nothing for me because they are hidden in the Lord. They, the Lord will reveal them in his second coming in the first coming they are they've received salvation and with it persecution they've been persecuted somebody is sitting at the side of the road begging for money and we walk past that person without even greeting that person acknowledging their existence but in the next life when the Lord comes he will give them glory because they were patient on this salvation he will give him glory in the second coming when we see that beggar in the next life as shiny as the Sun will be shocked because they were patient for the Lord's sake they hid themselves they hid themselves the Holy Mother the ultimate lesson for all of us my sweetheart my mother my holy mother the ultimate lesson for all of us the reason why there was not much mentioned about her in the Holy Bible because she lived that salvation with utmost patience she hid herself because she believed realized my son is coming again to get me so I will be patient awaiting his return. I will be patient till the end, enduring all persecutions and all hell against me because my son is the love 
of my life. I live for him. I die for him. I breathe him. I eat him. I drink him. He is everything for me. And the Lord made her everything when he came again. Hello, mom. I love you, mother. I love you. When are we going to grow up in spirituality? When are we going to say, I am willing to learn? When are we going to humble ourselves before the Lord? When? The first coming, the Lord is glorified in those who accepted him only. The second coming, Christ is glorified in everyone. Those who accepted him and those who rejected him. Those who accepted him in his second coming, he will be glorified in them because they will shine like stars in the heaven of Christ. And those who rejected him, the Lord will be glorified because he is the true judge, the just and fair judge. I gave you every chance to accept me. You rejected me. I'll be glorified in my justice and I'll be glorified in my love. Choose which one do you want, my love for you or my justice for you. If I judge you, you're going to go to hell. And if I, uh, you allow me to love you, I'll give you the heaven of all heavens. Christ will be glorified in all. Psalm 110 verse 1, 110 verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So those who went against the Lord and, and crucified him and denied him, they will be made the footstool of the Lord in the second coming. In the second coming, all will bow before the Lord Jesus. Every knee will bow before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, whether they like it or not. Here, when Christ receives his full glory, those who are with him shall be glorified with him. Salvation, first coming. Glory, second coming. Number three, honor. This is the honor of Yahweh. As a Christian, you do not walk with your own honor. The moment you, gave, you give your life to Christ and were baptized in his holy name. You see, when we receive the Lord Jesus, as Lord and Savior, it is no longer my honor. It is the honor of Christ in which I walk with. And what is the honor of Christ? Two things, Good Friday, Sunday resurrection, the cross and the glorious resurrection. This is the honor of Christ. Will you accept walking in the honor of Christ? Well, guess what? When you received him as your Lord and your Savior, you said to the Lord from this moment onwards, I live, but not I, but you, Christ, who live in me. Therefore, I'm not walking with my own honor, with my own dignity, with my own name and glory. Everything now is Christ. So what is the honor of Christ? One day I will be dragged in the streets, kicked, punched, spat on, and ridiculed. And another day I'll be risen gloriously and being exalted by everyone. Will you accept the honor of Christ? Will you accept when you are stepped on, stripped of your rights? This is the honor of Christ. It's not just glory, it's also persecution. Without that carrying the cross, there is no resurrection. You are no longer walking with your own honor. It's the Lord's. So sometimes you need to accept somebody telling you off why you're angry, why you're upset, why you're sad, why you're crying. Why are you so broken? Oh, so-and-so said to me all these nasty words. Well, tough luck. Good for you. Enjoy it. <laughs> I will not sleep until I smash their head. That's your honor, not Christ's. The honor of Christ is to say along with him, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. If you cannot live this, you're still walking your way, not Christ's. You need to learn. You need to learn to be happy when people are telling you off. It's a lesson. Life is so many lessons. This is one of them. Are oh, they speaking so many nasty things about you? Really, sir? Oh, beautiful. You're not upset? No. Why not? He taught me not to be upset. He taught me to love my enemy, to pray for those who persecute me, to forgive those who gave me a hard time. It's the Lord. It is the Lord. You know, when you have the Lord in your heart, you live so peaceful, surrounded by fire, surrounded by hell, surrounded by chaos, surrounded by demolition, worries me not. It's the Lord. He knows. He sees. He's in charge. It's not my work. It's His work. It's not my way to defend myself. It's the Lord's. I keep silent for the Lord to talk. I won't retaliate. I won't answer back. I'll leave the Lord 
to answer them. And let me see what they'll do when the Lord puts them on the spot. What are they going to do? Where are they going to go? When you stand in God's court and Christ is your, is not your QC. Oh my goodness. Imagine standing in God's court and the Lord is not my defender. I am finito. Honor. It's the Lord's honor, not yours. You are walking in, in the Lord's honor. And if you did this on earth in the second coming, he will give you his honor. They all shouted, Alleluia, salvation, glory, honor. Now this honor and then power, what all of them belong to the Lord, our God. So now the Lord in his second coming will give me glory. When I am patient with his salvation in his first coming and the second coming, he will give me his glory and followed by his own honor. What is his own honor? Father, the glory that I had with you from the very beginning, give it back to me. I and the father are one. The honor will be, the Lord will say in front of his angels, in front of everyone in heaven, this is my son. We are one. There is no greater honor than being one with Christ. There is no greater honor. In the second coming, he will give you his honor. On earth, the Lord's honor was his first coming, which was Good Friday. Carry my cross, he said to all of us. And as they did to the Lord, they will do to us. In the second coming, he will give me his resurrection. Honor given to you in his glory. Fourth one is power. Power belongs to the Lord, our God. Power in here, really, it's not translated 100% accurate. It's more so almightiness, which we refer to God as the om omnipotent. The omnipotent God, meaning the almighty, the almighty God. The almightiness is given, it belongs to the Lord, our God. Now, what is the difference between power and almighty power when god uses his power every time we sin he will wipe us from existence if he uses his power every time we make a mistake he will wipe us when he uses his his almightiness every time we sin we destroy things out of destruction he brings out something constructive out of sin brings holiness out of sinners brings saints that's almighty so this almightiness belong to the Lord our God. Thank you, Lord, for being almighty. Because while I was a sinner, you changed me into a saint. While I was walking in darkness, you brought me into the light. While I destroyed things, you built me up, Lord Jesus. Instead of wiping me from existence, you made me the son to the almighty God. Amazing. From a slave to a son. Belonging to Satan, now I belong to the Almighty God because he is almighty, capable of doing anything and everything. God, the powerful, raising the dead, he showed his power. But God Almighty, he changed the heart. That's almighty. You see, Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now that is the power of God. But Lazarus died again in Cyprus. Instead of Israel, now he has got another grave. <laughs> In Cyprus, he died again. The one whom the Lord raised died again. This is the power of God. He raised the dead. But the same God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, all glory to his holy and mighty name. When he changed the heart of Lazarus, Lazarus never died again. It takes the mightiness of God to change someone forever. It takes the power of God to raise them from the dead temporarily. Almighty changes the heart of men powerful raises the dead and they die again what is the ultimate miracle the lord can do in anyone's life changes your heart that's the ultimate because once the heart is changed you'll live forever but if i'm raised and the heart is not changed it benefits me not i'll die again as long as the heart is not with the lord i'm dead when am i alive when my heart is all for the lord and the lord said it wherever your treasure is your heart is there also wherever your treasure is your heart is there also the lord will ask every one of us what is your treasure is it money is it fame is it a throne is it a rank is it a position is it someone or is it me am i your treasure well wherever your treasure is your heart is there also if i jesus christ of nazareth am your treasure guess what I am in the heaven of all heavens, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Why are you looking for me 
downtown. I'm not here. I'm in heaven. Stop looking down. Look up. Stop going down. Go up. Stop searching for me in the wrong places. Where are you looking for me? Where are you searching for me? In this world? You will not find me in anything to do with this world. If you are seeking fame, I'm not there. If you are seeking high places, I'm not there. If you are seeking power, position, prestigious life, I am not there. Nothing to do with this world. I am in the heaven of all heavens. Look up. When you look up, you see clarity, you see purity, you see everything beautiful. Look up, my beloved. Change your way of thinking. Stop living earthly, live heavenly. Stop living physically, materialistically, live spiritually. Change your lifestyle, change your way of thinking. So now I need to learn to pray and ask the Lord Jesus to give me this gift where I no longer live for myself, I live for him. Ask him, Lord, I don't know how to let go of my own way of thinking. It's so hard to let go and it is. Let me tell you, even saints struggled with this. To let go of oneself, it is not easy. Even saints struggled with it. We think we are doing it the Lord's way without realizing we've been doing it our way all along. We stood and preached, attacked and did this and that, thinking this is the Lord using me. Eh, unbelievable. To walk with Christ and to follow Christ, it's not that easy to do. It is not that I studied and I read this and I learned this and I researched this. Please, you need to live, not only live with the Lord, you need to live the Lord. See, living with Him is one thing and living Him is a totally different thing. Living with Him, sometimes you can do things your way even though you are living with him but living him you are no longer you it is all him but let's start from the basics so we don't complicate things you wake up in the morning lord i thank you for this day i thank you for this start i thank you for this new life written for me yesterday is the past gone dead put aside today is a new life is a new start I can make a difference in my life today. I've been given a totally new opportunity to do things the Lord's way where I failed yesterday. Thank him for the morning and say, Lord, whatever happens today, may your name be glorified in your child. If it means today I cry and you're happy, let it be. If it means I get hungry and you get filled, let it be. If it means I fall and you stand strong, Lord, let it be. If it means I get ridiculed and you are honored and glorified, let it be. Let it be. Whatever happens, Lord, may your name be glorified always. But Lord, I beg you, allow me to live for you, Lord. Not for me, but for you. Amen.